You're good. I'm good? Yeah. Yeah. This absolute icon is the American classic of a generation. This truck is like a hood ornament on the United States of America itself. The American flag bumper sticker on the back is completely redundant. These 1973 to 1987 square body Chevy trucks were the last fossil of old GM that held on long enough for a lot of us non-boomers to experience. And they're valuable now for a lot of reasons. It makes perfect sense. But for starters, this thing looks awesome. You see, part of the whole legend of classic American cars is they put the sheet metal where they wanted it and all other considerations took a backseat. And this thing doesn't even have one. Practicality, safety, efficiency, forget it. Not a priority. Number one, does this thing look right? That was how they built them. Back in the smoke-filled rooms that this truck came out of, a car had to look wide and square from the front, and it had to look low and long from the side. So, I don't really buy the line that this was back when trucks were trucks, and they were work tools and nothing more, and they weren't built for looks. It's flattering that people think these square bodies are sexy on accident, but they're definitely not. These were designed from the ground up to have the right shape and proportions. And that's a fundamental difference between these and new trucks. New trucks have to rely on loud, aggressive styling to cover up the fact that they're not conventionally attractive vehicles, whereas a square body is in good enough shape to look bold naturally. It stems from a natural struggle between efficiency and design, right? The most efficient vehicle or house or critical pile for that matter depends on the surface area to volume ratio which is always going to be most efficient for a sphere. Absent the ability to make a literal sphere, it's going to be a cube. So in general, when you look at the thing, the closer it is being cube-shaped or spherical, semi-spherical, the more efficient it is. And because efficiency is a natural enemy of luxury, the less special it is. Look at a Nissan Versa hatchback, basically a cube. Look at the houses in these new cheap little cookie-cutter neighborhoods, basically cubes. Look at a modern crew cab pickup, way closer in overall shape to a cube than this truck is, right? So these square bodies are incredibly distinctive based on shape alone, and you can't miss the trademark shoulder line running down the truck's sides to add definition. The truck's bumpers and its grill and its tailgate are low and relaxed. There is not an outrageous amount of dead air in the wheel wells, and the sides of its eight-foot bed come up low. In fact, the whole belt line of this truck is markedly lower than a new truck's, and that does a number of things. It makes the truck easier to drive because you can see around yourself. You have less blind spots. It makes the truck look better. It makes the truck easier to use as a truck because you can actually get things in and out of the bed without a crane. And it just makes the whole truck feel nicer. makes the whole truck feel more natural to sit in hell, to stand around and have a conversation next to. I know this is not, this is an old truck review and not a new truck hate fest, but... These new trucks, they they just feel like they have their pants hiked up to their nipples. And you want to know what else isn't coming back? Full metal car exteriors. Walk up to this thing and everything you see or touch just about is going to be steel. Chrome bumpers, chrome trim, all of which is actual metal. The hubcaps are metal. The wheels are painted steel. The headlights are glass sealed beams, not plastic. Metal side mirrors, metal door handles, chrome rain gutters. There was a post actually on Reddit the other day of a brand new truck that had been struck by lightning. And the lightning melted all of the plastic parts of the truck. Which is to say, the lightning melted half of the truck. This truck, you lose those little amber front turn signals and your tail lights, as well as the center section of the grill. And that's about it. And boy, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with plastic. I mean, some of my favorite uh, Ziploc bags are, are are made of plastic, but steel construction is just... It just feels nice, you know? It feels it feels authentic. General Motors proudly slapped two-tone paint jobs on a lot of these trucks, and in my opinion, two-tone is the way to go on square bodies. It is a very proper vintage look, and it suits the bodies of these trucks well. There's not just one two-tone paint scheme for these trucks, by the way. In general, you had three to four different patterns of two-tone paint in any given year, which themselves varied a little bit from year to year. For instance, In 1987, 
You could get one of these trucks with just the roof of the cab painted the secondary color. They called that the conventional or just the area under the lower body molding that was called the special or both of those combined that was the deluxe or finally the full blown two tone paint job like this truck has. This was called the exterior decor package and it also threw in the hood ornament. By the way, the full two tone on the earlier square bodies, the 1973 to 1980 trucks was a little different. The middle section, its upper edge rode the truck's shoulder line. That 1981 redesign, by the way, that separates the earlier from the later model square bodies was its only major redesign and it really wasn't really even all that major. Basically with like the climate around gas, oil, emissions, all that stuff at the time, they sent this truck back through the wind tunnel midway through its life to squeeze a little more aerodynamicism out of it. Yes, back through the wind tunnel. The original 1973 square bodies, I don't know if they were the first trucks, but they were probably some of the first trucks to be as extensively wind tunnel tested as they were. And while it's hard to believe now, they were considered relatively rounded off at the time, and GM was very proud of how aerodynamic they were. It's funny, now cars are designed from the ground up with aero as a huge priority, and it's, it's, it's good and bad, right? Because it makes everything kind of homogenous, everything's kind of got a jelly bean shape now. But back in these days, they basically just made a giant square block, sent it through the wind tunnel, made a couple tiny little adjustments to their big right angled block, and that was considered, oh, now it's aerodynamic. Then for 81, right, the front fenders, the hood, and most noticeably, the grill and the headlights were all changed. That is the bulk of the difference between an early square and a later square. Front fenders, hood, grill, headlights. I personally like the look of the earlier models a little better. I think most people do, but the later models do get a little better gas mileage since in addition to lower wind resistance, the 1981 and up trucks are actually substantially lighter as well by a couple hundred pounds. Overall though, these trucks did not change very much for being on sale for 15 plus model years. That's a long run for a single model. And while GM did tweak little things with the truck's appearance from year to year, mechanically, when you pop the hood on one of these Chevy trucks, it's like blowing the dust off the Constitution. It's been the same for 200 years and it might get a little adjustment every few decades, but it stays pretty damn recognizable. The Chevy powertrains they ran in these square bodies were just an evolution of what came in the Chevy trucks before 73 and the Chevy trucks before those Chevy trucks and the Chevy powertrains that came in the trucks after the square body and the ones after them were likewise just evolutions of what's under the hood of this truck. By the way, while these are generically referred to as the 73 to 87 Chevy trucks, it's kind of a misnomer because some versions of this truck did hang on past 1987. Basically, for the 1988 model year, GM released a square body's replacement, but for instance, they kept selling the three quarter ton and one ton crew cab square bodies all the way through 1991 because the new truck didn't have crew cab version till 1992. Likewise, the Chevy K5 Blazer and Chevy Suburban SUVs derived from the square body truck were sold through 1991 because the new Blazer and Suburban based on the new truck didn't arrive till 1992. So when you see a 91 Suburban here, you're like, that, that, that's a 91, that's why. All of this is the reason why the truck that we're looking at, this 87, is technically called a Chevy R20, not a C20 or a K20 like they would traditionally be called. Since GM was intending to sell the old trucks and the new trucks side by side for a few years, for the 1987 model year right before the new trucks came out, GM swapped the traditional C and K names on the square body out for R and V, chosen at random seemingly, so they could use C and K on the new trucks. So yeah, this is a Chevy R20 Silverado. Anyways, the Silverado was the highest of this truck's three trim levels for 1987. The first few years of the square bodies had four trim levels and then they condensed them and these trucks were old school in the sense that the trim levels were exactly that. They were levels um, of trim. The engine, transmission, payload, suspension, electronic features, even different paint jobs were all completely independent of trim levels. So basically for 87, you had the Custom Deluxe, which was the base model. Then you had the Scottsdale and then the Silverado. And as you moved up through the trims, you got more moldings on the exterior, more chrome on the exterior, nicer headliners more insulation in the cabin, carpeting, 
nicer seat upholstery, the door panels got dressed up a bit, and the Silverado got a full gauge package. And if you look all the way back in 1973, up through 87, the trim levels and what they offered tracked very evenly through the years. They always offered basically the same stuff. It was creature comforts to make the truck more like a car inside. And the upper trims like the Silverado, they were a tool that GM was using to advance this concept that these trucks could be used as a car. And this was actually a seminal moment for trucks and really the entire American car industry. The square bodies were in a lot of ways especially mechanically, they were really just one point in a long and steady evolution of GM trucks, but they were really the first trucks to be marketed directly to family guys, and it absolutely worked. There have been several big shifts by trucks in this direction over the decades. The 94 Ram, the 97 F-150, the uh, actually the 88 Chevy trucks that came out right after this one, but this was one of the first. This was one of the earliest and 50 years later, this has turned out to be the only workable retail business model of the American car industry. It's the only thing they know how to do and make money doing. Ford and GM, sell they sell some other stuff like Mustangs and Escapes. Those, all that stuff is really just window dressing. The only thing Ford and GM make any real money on is full-size body-on-frame pickups and full-size body-on-frame SUVs based on them. And the reason they sell as many of those as they do is because GM and Ford cleverly learned to pump suburban neighborhoods full of them and not just job sites. So this being a Silverado doesn't necessarily mean that this truck is loaded otherwise, but spoiler alert, the deeper we get into this thing, the more you'll realize it is. The one odd exception is the wheels, kind of. I mean, Chevy offered several different wheel upgrades for these trucks, but only on half tons. This being a three-quarter ton, it was not eligible for them, so you were stuck with the basic steel wheels. But these hubcaps, as ghetto as they are, they are absolute classics. These were everywhere on all sorts of GM trucks and vans, and for decades, they are instantly recognizable, and I just think they look right here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change them. I would not trade these out for actual wheels. Anyways, beyond trim levels, the list of standalone options that GM offered for these trucks was staggering because well for one thing it was a different time that's just how they did it it's how gm did it and a lot of the stuff we take for granted now you had to pay extra for back then like let's start with power steering this truck's got power steering but it wasn't standard it was an extra cost option power brakes on this truck they were standard because it's a three-quarter ton but on a half ton power brakes were optional how about air conditioning and a radio they were not standard equipment on these trucks. You had to pay extra for them. This truck does have both. Power windows, power locks, again, standalone options. You could have a Silverado without them or a base model custom deluxe with them. This truck's chrome front and rear bumpers and, like we said before, it's two-tone paint. You might think those would be associated with the Silverado trim, but they're not. They're standalone options. You could get any square body with or without chrome bumpers. By the way, if you wanted the Silverado's signature bright exterior molding package or the Scottsdale's black exterior molding package on a lower trim truck, you could pick those out specifically and GM would sell them to you. Other random things, uh, cruise control, standalone option, this truck's got it. Dual fuel tank, standalone option, this truck's got them. Uh, G80 was the option code for a rear locker as GM called it. It's not really like a full-blown electronically locking rear differential. It's a clutch type limited slip. But again, you could get it on any square body and shocker, this truck's got it. Are you sensing a theme here? All right, so let's shut up about power door locks and side moldings for a minute. There is one particular crown jewel that this truck possesses. And unlike all those other random trinkets that GM was slinging onto any square body they could, this was one option that GM was going to make you work for. Well, it wasn't really GM making you work for it. It was the government. But anyways, square body pickups came as half tons, three quarter tons, or one tons. This truck is a three quarter ton. So it's got a stronger frame, stronger springs, stronger rear axle, stronger brakes, etc. So that the payload capacity and the towing capacity are higher than for a half ton. You can tell it's a three quarter ton because it says 20 on the side rather than 10, pretty obvious. What is less obvious about this truck is 
that it's not just a three-quarter ton, but a heavy-duty three-quarter ton, meaning in terms of capacity, it's right in between a regular three-quarter ton and a full ton, versus the regular three-quarter ton, this heavy-duty three-quarter ton has stronger front springs and stronger rear springs, a stronger frame, bigger rear drum brakes, heavier-duty front shocks, and a front sway bar. It's worth noting, by the way, that most of what I just mentioned could all be optioned onto a standard three-quarter ton if you wanted, but still, the Heavy Duty had a stronger frame. It literally had thicker frame rails. And the thing is that the Heavy Duty unlocked some doors, if you will. For instance, see the little TP emblem on the side of this truck's cab. Now, that means that this truck is a camper special, which was exclusive to the Heavy Duty. Now, the camper special itself, I, I could give a rat's ass about it, didn't mean a whole ton. I, by 1987, all the camper special gave you was a wiring harness to hook a camper top up to and a thicker front sway bar. Gee whiz, right? The only thing the camper special is good for, in my opinion, is to mark this truck as a heavy duty. Seriously, without this little TP on the side, we would have no idea that this is a heavy duty model. I mean, the only thing that I can think of that visually distinguishes the heavy duty is the presence of the front sway bar. But again, you could option a standard three quarter ton with that front sway bar. So even that's not really a sure thing. So... When you see the TP, you know you're dealing with the big guy, and why do you care? Is it the stronger suspension? Is it the thicker frame? Maybe. But, remember when I said that the heavy duty opens some doors? Yeah, well, it opens one big door. And by big, I mean big, like physically large. The heavy duty was the entry point for Chevy's outrageously large 454 cubic inch big block V8 engine. The big block Chevy once a staple of GM's most powerful vehicles, their muscle cars, their Cadillacs, their trucks, the further you got away from the 60s, the harder it was to get GM to sell you a big block because it was getting harder for GM to get the government to let them sell you a big block for obvious reasons. I mean, the 454 is not exactly politically correct. So by 87, you couldn't get a big block V8 in any car. And even if you wanted to get a big block in a truck, the law said you could only get a big block in a big truck, a truck with a gross vehicle weight rating of greater than 8,500 pounds to be exact, which is exactly what the heavy duty is. It's a truck with a GVWR of exactly 8,600 pounds. It's a total loophole mobile. And that's why you care about the stupid TP. When you see the TP, you know it's a loophole truck. And you, so you know it was allowed to have the big block. One last cherry on top is the full floating rear axle. The way the axles in the square bodies worked was, at least in the later square bodies like this one, half ton came with a 10 bolt rear axle. Three quarter ton came with a 14 bolt semi floating rear axle, which is stronger than a 10 bolt. But the one ton came with the Mac Daddy full floating 14 bolt rear axle, which was the strongest. But if you got the three quarter ton heavy duty and then took the big block option, you got the 14 bolt full floater from the full ton. That's exactly what this truck's got with the optional G80 rear locker, no less, which by the way, is considered to be a better match for the stronger 14 bolt axles than for the 10 bolts because the added stress from the locking is known to overpower the weaker axles and damage them. So strongest axle with the locker, this is the ideal package for a square body rear axle. As for rear axle ratio, the standard ratio for a truck option away, this one is, would be 342. If you paid 38 extra dollars, you get 373s or 410s. I honestly have no idea which of these three ratios is in this truck, but if I had to guess, knowing what I know about whatever gentleman must have ordered this thing, I feel like it probably has one of the higher optional ratios. Not because they're necessarily better for this thing, but because they cost extra money. If there's one thing I can tell you about this guy is that paying extra money was definitely up his alley. Also, based on the way it drives, I could believe this is 373s or 410s. But there's here's the thing about having a high rear end ratio in this truck. This is a three-speed automatic with no overdrive. GM had not yet engineered a four-speed automatic strong enough to put behind the 454. You could certainly get a four-speed automatic in a square body, a half ton, or a regular three-quarter ton, but not the heavy-duty units like this truck or the full ton. I mean, it makes sense. The three-speed was older, it had been around longer, it had, had more time to be built up and proven, and so that was what GM trusted with the higher capacity trucks versus the fledgling four-speed unit. But honestly, honestly, it's a pretty big drawback for this truck. If you're trying to do modern speeds on the highway, 
This thing is going to be revving and howling and sucking gas like you wouldn't believe. And while the 454 is cool, it's a big block. It's special. It's rare. It's comically huge. It wins bragging rights. It's hysterical to hoon around town. And it fills the square body's cavernous engine bay quite nicely. Honestly, the play with the square bodies is probably the 350 V8. So with the engines in the square body, right? You could get a six cylinder, you could get a small block Chevy V8, or you could get a big block Chevy V8. And although the details fluctuated from year to year, this was true from 73 to 87. Six cylinder, small block V8, big block V8. Not really gonna address the six cylinder engines or the diesel engines. There was also pretty much always a diesel option that came in these trucks. The gas V8s are really their bread and butter. Those were what was most common in the day. Those are what was most what is most popular now. And in general, for most of Square Body's run, you could get a smaller small block V8, that's the 305, a bigger small block V8, that's the 350, or the big block 454. Those were kind of the big three. Those were the big three gas V8s, 305, 350, 454. And there were a couple reasons why that mid-level 350 is arguably the Goldilocks of the Square Body lineup. Number one, you get a half ton or three-quarter ton square with the 350, And get a four-speed automatic with overdrive. Crucial on the highway. Number two, gas mileage, kind of to that same end. General Motors big block engines, they get absolutely awful gas mileage. Uh, All of them do. And there's nothing you can do about it. They just do that. This truck's got a 20-gallon fuel tank. Well, I mean, technically it's got two of them. We were only running one the day that I drove it. Well, my regular car that I've been driving around every day for five plus years is also a V8 with a 20 gallon tank. So I have an idea of how quickly a V8 drinks 20 gallons. And wow, this truck is thirsty. With a 454 like this, you can expect 10 to 11 miles per gallon maximum on the highway. That's like that's like doing 55 or 60. And you're gonna get seven or eight around town. And again, these big blocks, they are just like that. That's just what they do. And you're never going to be able to tune it out of them. It just comes with the territory. Also intrinsic to the big block, cold bloodedness. On startup, these take a while before they are completely warmed up and happy, since naturally, bigger block equals bigger heat sink. But the 350, Chevy's larger small block and probably their most famous V8 ever is universally loved. It's an excellent blend of power and fuel economy. Plus, there are just a lot of incidental benefits to 350 ownership, like parts availability, stronger aftermarket, stuff like that. As for the three, why the 350 and not the 305, well, basically, you can think of the 305 as like the 737 Max of Chevy small blocks, right? And just like the 737 Max, it was a crude rehash of an existing design, the 350, that was intended to make it more fuel efficient. But... The 305 does not get a ton of love because in terms of power and drivability, you would hope it would just be a 350 scaled down by 13%, but it's really not with a rated power deficit of 20%. And even that rated deficit doesn't tell the whole story because of how they hacked those 45 cubes off of it. They took the displacement out in the form of bore rather than stroke. So the 305 has a less ideal bore to stroke ratio than the 350. So even horse for horse, the 350 has better horses. And you know what? Most people don't even really regard the 305's gas mileage benefit to be much at all. So there you go. Now, for 1987, okay, all of these engines got one big significant upgrade. Probably, arguably, the biggest news in the square body engine lineup since the trucks were introduced, 1987, is arguably the pinnacle of the square body from a mechanical standpoint. And this is one of the main reasons why. Fuel injection. It's throttle body injection. It's TBI, which was GM's primitive first cut at fuel injection. Basically, the TBI unit just sat on top of the engine where the carburetor used to sit. Big, round, classic air cleaner and all. And it literally just sits there and uses two little shower head looking things to spray fuel down the engine's intake. I mean... You can sit there and watch the little shower heads spray the fuel. It's not the most efficient system in the world, but it is incredibly intuitive. And when the square bodies 305, 350, and 454 V8s got TBI in 87, it made these trucks get better gas mileage. It made them easier to start and run. It made them more powerful. 
TBI made the small blocks a lot more powerful. The 454's power bump was more subtle. And I've said for years, I think the sweet spot for car technology, I mean, at least for me, like the stuff I like to drive is right after the introduction of fuel injection. That's the one thing I would rather have electronic than mechanical. And the whole avalanche of other computerized stuff that started getting stuffed into cars after that, I could mostly do without. That's exactly what this truck is. It's got a primitive TBI computer that reads a handful of sensors. And otherwise, this truck is digitally naked. And you know how computer stuff is. I mean, when it's new, it's great, but it has the shelf life of a banana on a countertop. And when it goes sour, it takes the whole car with it. In any case, small block or big block, these V8s were classics in their own right. They've got naturally good balance, sound, and power, despite being kind of prehistoric in design. They're iron block, iron heads, pushrod valve train, hard to kill but eminently serviceable, and they're just sort of a long-standing institution, even more so than Ford or Dodge V8s, because they put so many of these in so many cars and trucks for so long and changed them so gradually and kept all the parts so interchangeable. Of all the vehicles out there, these have to be just about the easiest to find parts for. I mean, you could practically rebuild this whole truck out of a catalog for, for peanuts. And these trucks, because they're big and simple and understandable and you have room to move your hands around in the engine bay and they're pushrod engines, so much easier to work on than overhead cam. Because parts are everywhere, these are actually fun to work on. You know, there's a reason mechanics make money. Most cars, especially newer cars, working on them is like, it's work. Vehicles like this are the reason why the concept of working on a car recreationally is a thing. So, okay, so speaking of Ford and Dodge, why the Chevy truck? Why, why is this the classic truck? Why not a 70s or 80s Ford or Dodge? Okay, so for Ford, one big advantage of the Chevys over the Fords is, again, the GM interchangeability. And also, the Chevys ran for longer with less changes, which makes them a little more recognizable, a little bit more of an icon, I think. Number two advantage for the Chevy square bodies over the 70s and 80s Fords. Keeping the same look forever only works if it looked good to begin with, right? Well, the Chevys, the Chevys were prettier trucks than the Fords, and you can call that an opinion, and you can disagree with that opinion, and some people will, but I think in general most people don't. The third and final big advantage I'll give the Chevy is the front suspension. So here's the deal with front suspensions. Chevy trucks, the two-wheel drives like this one, they used an independent front suspension, upper and lower A-arms with coil springs. GM called it the massive girder beam front suspension. Basically, it was like a big beefed up version of a GM car front end. I like these because they drive well. The four-wheel drive Chevy trucks got a solid front axle. Square bodies were the last Chevy trucks with a solid front axle. This is considered by 4x4 people to be the holy grail of front axles because it's very durable. Ford on the other hand, took this weird in-between approach that they called the twin I-beam front suspension. I never liked them. This is what came in all of the two-wheel drive Fords of the 70s and 80s that competed with these Chevys, as well as the four-wheel drive Fords by the 80s. They had a different name for it. It's the same thing. Those Fords, I've driven plenty of them. They are a complete, they're a complete handful to drive, especially on the highway. The steering wanders all over the place for the seemingly the sake of chaos. Alone. Oh no, the solar winds are blowing this way. It, they require constant babysitting. Never enjoyed them. It's the, that's that, that front end, that, that uh, twin I-beam front end is supposed to be a balance between the durability of a solid axle and the drivability of an independent front suspension. But I, I just don't think it's a fundamentally good design. I think it actually tends to offer the worst of both worlds. So I'm just, I'm just way more of a fan of the front ends and the Chevy trucks of this era. As for the Dodges, Dodge's square body competitor ran from 72 to 93 with one big redesign in 1980. So it overlapped really, really closely with the Chevy. Those Dodges, especially after the 1980 redesign, were, in my opinion, really similar overall to these Chevys on a lot of levels. And... Some people even call those Dodges square body Dodges. The biggest difference probably is just that they sold way less of the Dodges. And honestly, my take on them is that they are kind of like a weird inverse knockoff of the square body Chevy where the knockoff is actually higher quality than the original. And that might be a controversial statement, but Luke and I, this is my cousin Luke Chevy. Luke and I say that from experience when we were teenagers, 
Luke's first car was N87 Dodge, and we spent a lot of time rolling around in that truck, cutting grass and stuff, and that Dodge, the sheet metal felt thicker, everything lined up better on that truck, inside and out. And then take, for instance, like the power window motors. I mean, I know it's a random little thing, but the window motors on that Dodge, they could run a locomotive. They were the stoutest units you've ever witnessed. And the power window motors on a Chevy truck like this are weaker than the blinking lights on a battery-powered birthday card. It's like, oh, they made this to last a, a week. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I know that might ruffle some feathers because those Dodges don't really have a huge following like these Chevy trucks do, but I've been in and out of a number of square-body Chevys, and I love them, but the best Chevy on its best day wasn't built like that absolute tank of a Dodge. But the Chevys are still the big name brand, if you will, between the two, mainly just to, due to how prolific they were. That's the big advantage of Chevy ownership versus Dodge, more parts, GM interchangeability, more support, more aftermarket, bigger fan base. I mean, again, these are the official classic truck of the United States of America. And I wish I could tell you they were built like tanks, but quality with these is a mixed bag. So let me start by saying, I'm not really talking about mechanical quality. Mechanically, these trucks are as sound as anything. They are durable, they are serviceable, that you can keep them running forever. But the body and interior of this truck, they have hits and misses. For instance, the early square bodies have se severe rust issues. And we're from the inland south where literally nothing ever rusts. So I almost never even have to think about or consider rust when it comes to cars, but like take my grandpa's square body, he bought that truck brand new in 1974 in Montgomery, Alabama, and it never left Montgomery, Alabama. Cars do not rust in that area. Oh, oh, and it was kept in a barn on a concrete floor its entire life. Well, guess what? By the time that truck was 25 years old, there was rust creeping all along the sides of the bed, the tailgate. I mean, as kids, we thought it was the damnedest thing. I mean, it was basically the only rusty vehicle we had ever seen in our lives. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, the rust issues improved quickly through the first few years of the square body to the point where this 87, also a Southern truck, doesn't have those issues. But for early square bodies or for Yankees, it can be a big issue. Another thing you'll notice is that the doors are notorious for being hard to shut. I mean, you have to really slam them. And even when you do get them to shut, it's not that satisfying of a feeling. It's kind of mushy and gross. And this leads to one of the main problems with the interior, which is you'll frequently find square bodies with the door pull handles ripped off since they're too weak to withstand the monster force necessary to actually get the doors to shut. Speaking of opening and shutting things, when you pop the hood on this truck, the hood doesn't actually pop up on its own, so you have to bang the front fender with your fist, and then it pops up. Like Luke said, it's kind of a Fonzie thing, which I guess is, yeah, I don't know, it seems appropriate. And then the other thing with the hoods on these trucks, they've got these big spring-loaded hinge assemblies, which are awesome because, because you don't have to use a prop rod to keep the hood up, right? But you have to keep them lubed because if you don't, they'll start to get sticky and offer too much resistance and then you'll bend the hood trying to shut it. These hoods, they don't bend entirely out of poor design, by the way. They do that a lot, but that was intentional. It was done for crashworthiness. Then you've got the window motors. Again, they're failing. They all fail. They are way undersized. I'm sure GM saved a nickel worth of copper on each one of them. At least they're cheap, if not necessarily easy to replace since they're the same part number shared with every other GM car from that time period. Also shared with every other GM car from that time period. The classic 70s, 80s, 90s GM blinker stock. I hate this thing so much. Least satisfying blinker stock feeling of all time. Zero out of ten. You really can't even tell from feel alone, you know, if you got the stick to do the thing. And unfortunately, if you are looking to rely on diverse indications, your blinker unit is quiet, and the blinker lights on the dash are small and weak. I think they must have been designed by the same guy who made the window motors. It's kind of hysterical, really, because, like, of course GM would build you this chiseled steel monument of an American truck. <laughs> and then and then absolutely chintz out on random little things. Don't get me wrong. Like, look, I'm hypercritical when it comes to quality. 
None of this should scare you out of a square body. You know, it's fun to bitch and moan and whine, but at the end of the day, these trucks are a lot of fun. And the blinker stock doesn't change that. No, I mean, those quality issues, like, they're there, but they they just, they don't detract, they don't really mar the overall experience. I mean, look at this thing, okay? It's 70s GM. It's 70s America. It would look, it looks like it just rolled out of a barn or out, out from the parking lot of a 70s pool bar. And if you're out in the country and you can't see any other cars or buildings or stuff, and the only other man-made thing out there with you is the truck you just you don't have to be in 2022 for a minute that's kind of nice and you know you try to you park it and you try to walk away and you can't take your eyes off it because it doesn't look like anything else nothing is like big and wide and long and square like this anymore and if luke and i had nothing to do he and i could ride around and we i mean we have literally ridden this truck around in circles all day long and just not wanted to be anywhere else in the world this is a classic vehicle i mean this thing this works walking up to the truck you'll notice that the ride height puts you so that you're pretty much at the exact same height sitting in this truck as you are standing on the ground so sitting in here has a very natural feel luke says he thinks this is the perfect ride height this being a three-quarter ton two-wheel drive it's a little taller than two-wheel drive half ton and a little lower than a four-wheel drive half ton. Getting in and out is a bit of a climb, especially with no running boards. Not that I personally would want running boards on this truck, but what I would like is a grab handle of some kind on the dash or above the door frame inside to lift myself up into it. Part of the reason for that is that the seat cushion is very high up and it's extraordinarily thickly padded. It's nice, actually. I mean, one of the perks, this is one of the perks of the Silverado is this bench sheet's plush fabric. It's held up really well, as you can see. There's just one dead spot in the foam under the driver's left ass, but it's nothing an upholstery shop couldn't fix easily. In fact, the whole inside of this truck has held up well. It was probably pretty well taken care of, and you could almost, almost believe the five-digit odometer's 65,000-mile reading, but here's the tip. Never, ever trust a five-digit odometer no matter how true it seems and no matter what story you get told this truck is as clean as it is as as clean as clean as any square body and of course of course the guy luke bought it from had some miraculous story about the little old man who only drove it on wednesday and it oh it's totally true mileage it's a sixty-five thousand mile it's not it is not there are, you don't even have to dig that deep into the paperwork. There are numerous different records that reveal that this truck has rolled the odometer at least once. So we'll call it 165, but even that's speculation. Sitting up in here, this truck just, it just oozes the old GM feel. It just feels like old GM. It looks like it. It even smells like it. You can see that the upper half of the dash is padded. But the lower half is just body color painted steel. That's pretty old timey, even for 87. This dashboard, by the way, represented a big departure from the trucks it replaced and most trucks on the market in 73, in that this was basically like a car dashboard. Old trucks, the dashboard was like just a straight, plain, flat metal slab running from door to door with a couple gauges on it and a radio in the middle. These trucks have the big hooded gauge pot around the steering column and the radio and the air conditioner and all the driver's other secondary controls are all integrated into that. I like this design. I always, I always love the square body dashboard with the cutouts for the gauges and everything. It's very driver oriented. It's convenient. I just, I just think it looks good. The older truck dashboards, they just feel kind of antique to me. I, they're just kind of like too far before my time, you know? And you may also notice that this dashboard is kind of similar in overall shape to the 99 to 07 GM trucks. That's another one of my favorite truck dash designs. The one big glaring flaw with this one is that they put the radio so that when you're in drive, the shifter blocks it. But speaking of the shifter, it is a column shift and it feels so manly and mechanical to drop this thing down into drive. I'm pretty sure it lights up the same part of your prefrontal cortex as cocking a 12 gauge. And by the time you've got her in drive, that's right about the time you start to shift your attention down the big flat square hood outstretched like a metal version of Nebraska to the hood ornament. 
And by the time you've got the fog line in your crosshairs and you start to stretch out a little and get comfortable, that's when you notice that you've got pretty much unlimited man spreading space as this front bench seat stretches all the way across this 80 inch wide truck's cabin. Column shift, hood ornament, bench seat. There is no mistaking where or when this thing came from. And just like post-war America and just like post-war GM, this truck has an air of pride and dominance about it. How does it drive? Uh, for one thing, easy. It's fuel injection, so it starts the same way every time, just like a new car. The steering is not tight like a new car per se. It takes a little more input than a modern vehicle, but these trucks, four old trucks, have excellent steering. The Dodges were the same way by the 80s, and compared to a Ford or a pre-square body truck, these things were a huge leap forward in terms of like steering, handling, in-town drivability, and here's the thing, if you were to drive this around town back to back with a new truck, the trade-off is the new truck will be a little tighter and more precise, but this truck's visibility is so much better that the overall drivability is kind of a toss-up. Your skull is surrounded entirely by glass, and because of the way that this truck is, you can see where it ends. You know where each corner of the truck is at all times, and that's nice. Modern trucks with their tall fronts, high hoods, high beds, high cowls, thick window pillars. You, you really don't, you don't have a clue where that thing ends and the outside world begins. The steering wheel is big. It's got a large diameter. It's got a thin rim and it's got the little finger ridges on the backside. Again, classic GM. And while you don't really need a wheel this big in this truck, since it does have power steering, I like it. I just like the way it feels for the vintage factor and Honestly, a wheel any smaller would look funny in here because it is just huge. Practicality, this is a single cab truck. Most of them were back then and that limits it a little bit. I mean, this is Luke's car, it's his only car. And you notice stuff like, if it's the two of us with like some jackets and backpacks and other personal stuff we're dragging around for the day, there's no trunk to put it in, there's no back seat to put it in. So really you basically just kind of have to work all of your stuff up into a pile in the middle of the bench seat. Or you could put a toolbox on the truck. I imagine Luke will do that eventually. It would help day to day, although the truck looks really good without one. By the way, Square Bodies never had an extended cab. Although their Ford and Dodge competitors did offer extended cabs on and off over the years, the Square Bodies were the first GM trucks to offer a crew cab version. But again, D Ford and Dodge had already beat them to that too. Uh, what else? Uh, real cup holders. Real cup holders would be nice, but the big plastic ones from AutoZone, they fit in here pretty well. Of course, there is an ashtray, so if you just switch from coffee to cigarettes, good to go. Overall, and I already got most of my nitpicks out of the way earlier, overall, I've always loved the cabins of these trucks. The build quality definitely has some shady elements to it, but it wouldn't be GM otherwise, right? And the diversity of materials used in the cabin, I mean, all the different plush fabrics, the different metals of this Silverado is something that newer cars do not offer at all. And the design just has unapologetic Western flair. Out on the road, this truck, it rides like a Uranium 238 Atom. It absorbs a lot, but the reason it absorbs a lot is just because it's big and heavy and full of overlapping resonances. You can really smack a pothole with this thing and it just does not have that much of an impact up in the cabin. I mean, yeah, you're big, you're heavy, you're up high. You've got a lot of suspension travel. You've got these big wheels with a lot of sidewall. That's a big difference. That's something that newer stuff doesn't have. The big thick sidewalls that actually absorb bumps and potholes. Yeah, it just, it takes, it takes a lot to really throw this thing off. And despite being a three quarter ton, a three quarter ton HD no less, this truck really does not have a stiff ride. I mean, I don't think I'd call it soft, but I, well, I mean, pff, compared to, compared to a, like, I've driven some late model Ford Super Duties that felt like they did not even have springs. You know what I mean? Like those trucks, those, those are stiff. This isn't like that at all. It's very absorbative, but it's also very busy and jiggly. This truck sort of jostles and moves around just always at all times, at any speed on any road. And, and that's just an old truck thing. They're just like that. But it would probably be more subdued if this was a half ton. 
What the half ton can't quite do for you is match the three quarter ton HD on towing and payload. This truck is rated for over two tons payload in the bed and its tow rating would be in the neighborhood of 10,000 pounds. And that would be like maximum with trailer brakes, obviously, since that's over twice the weight of the truck itself. And if you were actually gonna use this thing to tow, that's where the 454 comes in. This 7.4 liter engine puts out a monstrous 385 foot pounds of torque. That's, that's more than the E39 BMW M5 that I reviewed two cars ago. And this, this weighs the same amount. This weighs, this weighs 4,000 pounds. That's more than any of the diesels they put in the square bodies, 385 foot pounds of torque. And, and it's, uh, it's a lot more actually than the diesels, even though like normally you think diesel equals torque. And so between the 454 and the diesels, the 454 is actually known as the most effortless hauler of the square bodies. And while the small block engines, they're sort of like the golden retriever of V8s, compared to the small block, the big block, I feel like the big block sounds kind of off key. It sounds kind of sick, wicked, and more industrial. This truck is 100% stock, by the way. This truck is 100.0% stock. That includes the exhaust. I would not change it whatsoever. I would keep the stock exhaust, absolutely. You hear the engine plenty. It's subtle, but it's always there. The 454's low range torque does not necessarily translate to speed per se. I mean, the truck's pretty fast, but still what it means is that this truck feels like it's pushed forth by an unstoppable force of nature. I mean, even when you're going 10 miles per hour, you feel like an office building sized block of solid concrete going 10 miles per hour. <laughs> like, if you were going down the road at a constant speed with your foot steady on the accelerator and a helicopter suddenly dropped 4,000 pounds of shingles into the bed, you wouldn't feel it. I mean, you'd feel it from a ride standpoint, but not a power standpoint, you know what I mean? Or like, if you're going steady speed on a flat road and you come up to a steep incline, you pretty much just keep your foot exactly where it is on the accelerator pedal and the truck just goes up the hill and you don't even feel that the hill is there. That's how this engine's outrageous displacement and torque present themselves. This is one of the last of a certain breed of American muscle cars, right? I mean, you couldn't get a big block in a car at this point. I mean, not even a Corvette had the torque of this truck in 87. So think about it, right? 385 foot pounds, big block power, driving a posi rear end with no weight over it. If you really just wanna be stupid and smoke some rubber, in 1987, this was the machine for it. I mean, it, it really wasn't marketed that way. And that's definitely not what the government wanted you using this thing for. But this truck with the 454, this was basically the Hellcat of 1987, right? Uh, no? Yes? Think about it. I mean, you know that's true because GM recognized it and openly acknowledged it with the 1990 454 SS truck. They marketed that truck as like a dumb power Hellcat machine because they knew it was the last stand of big block power that they could get into the hands of consumers who wanted a big block muscle car. That was the only way to do it. That was the generation of truck after the square body that they did that. As far as how it handles, I would say this truck handles itself pretty well. I mean, again, you've got the posi. This thing would have some traction issues otherwise. It's really good fit for this truck. The steering, again, is good. And you've got power and automatic everything. You know what? Call me a P word. I want something. I want that in something like this. If you throw this too hard into a clover leaf, it's exhausting, but not scary. Brakes are strong enough. They feel like a big, soft hotel bed pillow. I mean, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Let's be honest. None of us have decent pillows on our regular bed. You know what I'm, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. The accelerator pedal, on the other hand, is super stiff. Yeah. I mean, like, very stiff. I'm not sure if this is, like, by design to make you <laughs> save on gas or if it needs maintenance. Either way, I've driven other 80s American trucks like this, so it's natural by some token. And you're not missing anything with this truck being an automatic. Most of them were automatics, although I think Ford put out a lot more manual trucks in this time frame. But yeah, the three on the tree that you could get in this truck, cumbersome and difficult. The four on the floor, same thing, vague, difficult. The clutches were long and heavy. I mean, the whole experience would be entirely unergonomic and labor intensive. It would seem cool for like an afternoon and it would get old. Like if you were trying to daily this thing, so fast. And again, 
part of the beauty of this all power fuel injected square body is that it just doesn't lack for much versus a modern vehicle and drivability. But the living room couch feel of the cockpit and the authentic cowboy yeah, swag of this truck brakes, are completely unobtainable yeah, they're, they're at any brakes. price now. Yeah. This truck, it's just a treat to drive around. And I wonder how much of it is the truck, how much of it is, is what the truck represents. I mean, what's so special about a square body Chevy, really? I mean, it's just a series of sticks. The frame is a pair of sticks, the drive shaft, the axle, they're, they're just Very sticks. Right. They're push rod engines that came in everything else. I mean, there was no, there was no new art here, per se. I mean, you know, we were always around these. Our grandpa had that 74 for like 30 years. And when he flung the barn doors open and the sunlight started to flood that barn, the first thing it hit was the front end of that truck. He kept it in front of his tractor, in front of his John Deere. And you were there with the smell of the old barn, the wood and the grass and the oil and the gasoline. And Papa's country old man voice cutting through the air. And the first thing you saw was the front end of that 74 staring you down i mean like to talk about iconic and i mean luke's other grandpa had a square body too everybody's grandpa had these and like even old john had a square body old john he like i guess he you could call him like our ex step great grandpa the thing with was just between the and he had encephalitis which is a brain disease and then there was the gun stuff so like he kind of wasn't allowed to move out of our granny Grace's house after they got divorced and he actually had his own trailer. He just wasn't allowed to, like, exist there unsupervised because, again, he was insane and he shot everything and his trailer had a propane tank. And so, like, I just remember there being concern about that whole scene. And I, I actually, like, when I say he shot everything, like, one time he, I was there when he tried to shoot a rat behind that brown refrigerator with a twenty two. I mean, just an unforgettable... American and um well yeah and so uh, and yeah even old John drove a square body back in the day and just like the man himself these trucks these trucks are distinctly of their place and they're distinctly of their time for people like me and Luke and anyone else who grew up around the same time these trucks were always in the background of rural life with our elders and for us, elders like Granny Grace represented the last shred of American pioneer spirit. Granny Grace was the last in our family of a long line of farmers from lower Alabama. And we've gone away from that. And a lot of families have gone the exact same way. And Granny Grace, she was cut from a different cloth. She was about as country as they came. And this country in the 21st century isn't going to produce anybody like that again. And just like she was the last shred of the farming era of our family that lasted long enough for my generation to witness, these Chevy trucks, same thing. They were the last of old GM coming out of GM at, that, at the trailing end of that 15 or 20 year period where you could point back and say, oh yeah, GM was on top of the world back then. And they came out of that and were produced long enough all the way up through the late 80s and even kind of into the 90s to make an imprint on my generation. And my memories aren't unique. There are lots of people out there with the similar ones. But all of those people would be Americans. And those memories are unique to us as a group. These trucks were the last stand of the pre-internet, post-war boom era of American cars. These were the last stand of when America still had some of that final frontier spirit going. Like, And they represent that. They're big and brash and dominant and maybe even a little antisocial. They made a ton of these and they made them for a long time. So we all had a brush with them here or there. And that's fun. They're a cultural touchstone. They are a shared common experience. <laughs> Is, again, is it just the memories? I don't know. I mean, like, these are pretty fun on their own. Like, if you threw a Frenchman the keys to a square body, I think you'd get the idea. But still, these are kind of ours. These are kind of our thing. And sometimes, like, it's nice to have something that's just ours.